Um, my name is Nancy Navarro, and I'm a um, Montgomery County Council <coughs> member. Uh, I also am a member of the Board of Directors at COG, and I will be moderating this very um, important panel, which is the role of cultural and linguistic competence in healthcare delivery for the Latino community. So we are really fortunate uh, to have two leading experts on this issue. I know that in some of the um, this morning's presentations, this issue of um, cultural competency uh, was raised uh, across jurisdictions as a very important um, goal and uh, how to define that, how to achieve uh, cultural competency is really uh, always, I think, a challenge and when do you know that you have actually reached that mark, et cetera, I think it's always a question. So hopefully um, today we'll have an opportunity to hear um, from different perspectives what that really means and what it entails and then we'll have opportunity for questions and answer. So first, um, uh, immediately to my right, we have Mr. Juan C. Arroyo, MPH. He's a research analyst at the Health Determinants and Disparities Practice at SRA International Incorporated. In this role, he has helped develop educational and policy initiatives related to cultural and linguistic competency, including e-learning programs for health professionals and, prom and promotores de salud. Additionally, Mr. Arroyo has contributed to the upcoming inaugural evaluation of the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services in Health and Healthcare. Prior to joining the HDDP, Mr. Arroyo was a research member of the Latino Health Research Center at the George Washington University and of the Milken Institute School of Public Health Department of Prevention and Community Health. While at George Washington, Mr. Arroyo engaged in health research regarding health behavior and health disparities that explored the role and importance of cultural, situational, and structural, structural context in the lives of people. Next to Mr. Arroyo, we have Mr. Kinti Ibot, MPH. He is an accomplished public health leader with more than 16 years of health communications experience consulting to government agencies, nonprofits, industry, and commercial organizations. Mr. Ibot leads the Maximus Center for Health Literacy and supports a wide array of government sponsored benefit programs, such as the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid, Medicare, Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, Health Insurance BC, British Columbia as well as welfare to work and child support programs across the globe. He manages a talented team of health communication experts, researchers, writers, designers, translators, and digital experts who work to develop communications that improve public health programs, empower consumers, and foster healthier communities. Mr. Ibbett is an alumnus of the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public in health and serve as an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Systems Administration at Georgetown University. So we will start with Mr. Ibbett, and I believe that the presentation is ready here. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I would say it's been a while since I've been at GW. I think the last time I was here, we were over in the medical school. Um, so if any of you all remember that, it probably dates me a little bit more than most of the folks in the room. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity of being a part of this, this forum. Um, this month marks Health Literacy Month, and so I'd like to wish each and every one of you a happy Health Literacy Month um, and encourage each of you to kind of join in this crusade across the country to really bring uh, increased awareness and understanding to the importance of health literacy, and particularly as it relates to health insurance. Um, I think that's one of the biggest um, challenges before us as, as a community, a public health community, and so I really want to focus as we go through the, the presentation on the role of cultural and linguistic competency as it really relates to health insurance. Um, I'll start off with just a little bit about Maximus. Uh, this year we celebrate our 40th year um, as an organization. Um, we're global in our reach. We are pretty much in the United States, but also um, in Canada, the UK, uh, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia, um, Australia, and so it's about 16,000 of us um, that work together to really support about 4,000 government programs around the world um, across a variety of health and human service programs. Um, they range from uh, Medicaid, Medicare on the health insurance side to child support services um, in many of our social programs to workforce related services here both in the United States and in the UK. Um, and so with that said, we work pretty much in every, every state um, including the District of Columbia and, and several territories around the country. Um, but with that said, you know, a lot of our work is really helping reach 
um, different communities, um, specifically as it relates to gaining access to different health and social benefit type programs. Um, just a little bit about you know, our, our footprint currently. Um, right now we're supporting about 20 state Medicaid programs around the country, some of which um, touch on our largest Latino communities, um, Texas, California, New York, DC, Illinois, Michigan, Massachusetts. Um, we're really working in the cities or in the, in the states that have you know, pretty much the highest uh, concentration of Latinos in, in, in the country. And so um, in that regard, we are un uniquely positioned to really understand some of the nuances as it relates to communicating across not only racial and the different ethnic boundaries, but also geographical. Um, we also support about six uh, children's health insurance programs around the country um, and support a number of the state exchanges, including DC, Maryland, um, New York, California. It gets a little blurry for me at times, so I will admit, um, because with that, con you know, with that reach, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a lot of different programs, a lot of different communities, and so um, for me, it's a rush. Uh, I'll be quite honest. I love what I do. Um, but also from the, the human service side, we support a number of different social programs ranging from WIC to employment-related services to child support. Uh, we support here in, in the uh, DMV area, the, the Baltimore Child Support Program. We support both the DC um, and Maryland Medicaid programs as well as the exchanges. We support as far up as Pennsylvania, their enrollment project for Medicaid and West Virginia as well. So we have a really good uh, appreciation, I would say, uh, of some of the nuances, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic region. So with that said, I mean, so who are we talking about? Particularly on the, on the healthcare side, it's about 25 million lives um, around the country that we touch. Um, in short, it's about one out of every two Medicaid beneficiaries. We are, have the, the unique responsibility of, of being able to help them understand the different options that are avail available to them, um, help them go through the, the process of determining eligibility, going through this complex maze called enrollment, um, and then obviously for our, our exchanges, being able to kind of do the shop and compare and actually understand what are the appropriate plans and providers that are needed um, to support our individual and our family's unique health, health uh, conditions. So briefly, when I, when I look at this, I, I, I realize the responsibility when we're talking about different communities. Um, obviously, even within the Latino community, it's not necessarily one monolithic group. Um, I've had a number of conversations, and I, I kind of remember one advocate in California telling me, you know, my people don't always wear shirts and ties. And so how you represent us uh, really needs to reflect the, the nuances to our, to our community. And so who is this community? What is this community? I mean, it ranges from working mothers uh, to adolescents and youth to millennials, Gen X, um, veterans, the disabled community, um, not only physically impaired, but also visually impaired and or blind. Um, we're talking about our seniors, um, particularly uh, those that may be on Medicare or some of us that may be uniquely qualified for both Medicaid and Medicare under the dual eligibles program. Um, so it's a whole host of different communities that we serve um, as an organization and e within each of our different programs. And so a lot of that, it, it really takes a lot of awareness and understanding about the communities and being really vested in the communities to, to understand the nuances. I'm a, I'm a native Washingtonian, so for me, I, I take great pride in the, in the city and, and just being a part of, of this, this wave and this commitment as far as helping our residents get access to coverage. And you, I would find that that is the case with Melinda Matower in Texas, with Ferdinand Morales in, in New York City, um, Robin LaFrance, and I'm speaking of some of my leaders, some of my peers in the organization, but folks who, who come from different parts of the country and are really vested in the communities that they serve. It's not only reflected in our leadership, but it's also reflected in all of our staff. So let's start off with just talking about health literacy. I, I kind of start with the, the traditional construct, kind of goes back to that World Health Organization um, framework that was established back in the 90s. Um, but really, the degree to which we have the capacity to understand, process, take the appropriate action uh, related to health information and services. When we think about that, it's really one of the biggest challenges for us as a nation. I mean, the landscape is still changing. Um, you know, how we receive information, how we process it, um, how we take the appropriate action. It's a, it's a very individual type uh, model or approach. I mean, it's not necessarily a one size fits all. And so when we think about you know, the ability to make informed health decisions for our lives, for our families, for our children, for our parents. Um, it, it really is how we, we, we understand our conditions and how we apply that to some type of decision-making process so that we can, again, make better decisions around plans, plan options, providers, where we access care. And so it all comes together. 
I, I spent a lot of time in health and social marketing. And so when we talked about literacy, um, it was kind of one of those things where we didn't, it really, we didn't really understand how it fit in campaign work because we were so worried about trying to be heard by the masses, um, being able to reach um, the majority. In this work, I, I think one of the, the important distinctions that is that we're less concerned about making it sexy and more about making it understood by all. And it's not necessarily writing to sixth grade or eighth grade reading level, but making sure that we all can understand how to take the appropriate action based on very complex information. I'll admit, even although I work in this field, it's very difficult when you apply making health insurance decisions for your own life. It's very difficult to make those calls, particularly when you apply the pressure. Um, when you have someone who's going through that process, um, it, it's very difficult to figure out what are the right coverage options and what is the right benefit structure and what are the right um, services that, that I need or that my family needs um, so that I can make the appropriate health decisions. And so that brings me to the, the, the topic and the, and the perspective of health insurance literacy. Because I think that's really, you know, if we talk about eliminating health disparities, improving health outcomes um, as a nation, improving our overall health status, um, it really comes to the ability in which the overall status of the country raises our health consciousness and ability to make decisions. And so it starts with access. That's, that's the first step in the process. Um, before we get to screening, diagnosis, coverage, and hopefully recovery, it starts with access. Um, and so when we think about health insurance literacy, I didn't necessarily find a very good construct that adequately addressed all facets of the, of the, of the challenge. But what I would say is that Consumer Union, Lynn Quincy in particular, um, offered a pretty, pretty valid construct that kind of helped guide a lot of our thinking. When I say our, I mean many of us in, in this space. Um, it was really the ability for us to have the appropriate knowledge, have the knowledge, have the ability, and the confidence to make important decisions around how we navigate healthcare options. Um, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, there was a lot of reforms that were enacted, a lot of changes, a lot of paradigm shifts in the way that we approach making health coverage decisions. For many of us, our employers did that. Um, but for some of us who worked for maybe smaller businesses and the, the, the companies were no longer able to, to afford coverage for their employees, it was now encouraging a whole cadre of folks who never had to make that decision, even as more educated folks, maybe with higher education attainment, with a little bit more um, savvy in this space, we were all now being uh, asked to make these decisions. And so that wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. So when we think about health insurance literacy, I think one of the, the important tenets of that is to understand that consumers choose and manage based on their condition, based on what matters most to them. Just in our efforts, and I want to highlight just a couple of findings. I mean, this is not necessarily exhaustive, but these are some of the things that were kind of aha moments for me, things that when we step back over open enrollment one, two, and on the eve of open enrollment three, as many of us know, um, there's some important things that we know going into this. Everyone wants a good value. I'm no different. You're no different. We all want the best value. We want what's best for our families. But that, that term, what's best or good value, is very subjective. Is it the cheapest? Is it the best quality? Is it some combination of the two? And so just in that question, we have a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different influence, a lot of different things, priorities that, are, that matter the most to us. Um, what we've learned is that people still have a very difficult time understanding the changes, particularly from one cycle to the next. You know, what was afforded, let's say, in the DC Exchange as far as options last year will look a little different this year. Same thing in Maryland, same thing in New York, same thing in California. Massachusetts and around the country. And so being able to understand those changes, particularly if you've had coverage for an entire year, whether we're talking through the exchanges, through Medicaid managed care, this world is constantly changing with different options, different plan structures, different incentives, different penalties, different players. Um, and so I continue to challenge my team, our organization to think about not so much what we knew last year, but how are we going to figure out how to do things a little different this year? And how do we kind of keep our eyes and our, our, our ears open that maybe some of the things that worked last year are the things that we preserve, and maybe they're things that we've never even heard of or we've never even thought about that we need to adopt. New frontiers we need to forge across digital, mobile, social, print, um, and how we work not only with the states, but with the health plans, the providers, the public health community, individuals. Um, all of that is important. We know that many still have 
a lot of struggles making just basic decisions around health insurance. Just a lack of understanding on the terminology. And it, it's not necessarily intuitive. Um, the notion of care coordinator means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but what does that mean in the context of a coverage decision when we're talking about an integrated care plan or a managed care plan? Do we understand that the differences between the types of services that are being afforded to individuals? Um, again, when we, and I often, I grew up in the EPSDT world for many of us in the Medicaid space, so I, it was an important construct, screening, diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. So when I think about that in services, I often think about even when we sequence information and how we chunk information, um, knowing what's important to, to many and not necessarily starting off with surgery <laughs> and not starting off with you know, different types of drug therapies, but talking about the importance of prevention. So just helping individuals understand, which is often difficult, um, how to apply healthcare to their lives and where does it apply and what is the appropriate time to access that. Um, that's often a struggle when it comes to the terminology with different labs and, and things that they could order, certain drugs. And so it's very difficult. One of the things that we see in our call centers is just people um, really trying to make decisions based on their own health conditions. And so we go through, in many of our programs, like in New York, a conflict-free health assessment where we, even though we're the enrollment advisor or broker, for lack of a better term, for many of the states, we're also working with the individuals to, to sit down and go through what is your health condition? What matters the most to you? Um, where are you in your overall health, you know, your readiness? Uh, and then we start to approach the, the notion of, well, what are the right plan options? What are the right... Um, choices that are available to you and how do we go through that process of making a more informed health decision. One of the things that I'll say, and it's kind of painful, um, even though often we find that there are many, many new benefits and options being afforded to, to many new individuals, new communities, we find that there's often a resistance. Um, people are afraid of what they don't know. Um, even when the, ch the choices and the options are better. Um, I think in some of our states we saw as high as I'll say conservatively about 50, but I think I heard the number at 70 at one point, but let's just go with 50 for a minute. A 50% high opt-out rate in our dual eligibles program. That's 50% of the people that are picking up the phone and saying, I want out, when you've had additional coverage afforded to them because they don't understand the benefits or the structures. And it's, you know, it's simple, sometimes it's as simple as losing that trusted logo on your, uh, on your card. With these sweeping changes, some of the sometimes people um, there's a lot of fear and anxiety around some of these, these shifts in the, in the program structures and the way we're communicating around these programs. La last, more choices doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's easier to go through this process. And less choices doesn't necessarily mean that it's easier, particularly if we think about uh, the redetermination in Medicaid. Uh, many folks have come to rely on their, on their providers and understanding what benefits are afforded through their plans. And so just going through the redetermination process on an annual basis, that can be jarring for many because some of the, the, the benefits that they were afforded at the same time last year are no longer available. I think we see that in Virginia. We see that in some of the other states. So that is a part of this. And so one of the, uh, the underpinnings of, of the reform was to hopefully promote greater levels of competition. But again, it's harder for individuals, particularly people um, that may not necessarily have a, the, the same level of education attainment or the same background, let's say, we're coming from a country where health, you know, health insurance wasn't necessarily a term or a concept that we had. Um, it's very difficult to, la to navigate this, this landscape. As I mentioned, not only do the, the, the plans themselves change, um, but also how we're communicating around those options. One of the, the biggest, I would say, sweeping changes that we're on the eve of is a lot of the reforms anticipated through the uh, and new Medicaid managed care rules. Uh, recently, CMS issued their notice for proposed rulemaking, and I'm only focusing specifically around the communication aspects. Um, but it will change how we communicate around uh, different features of managed care, um, around enrollment in terms of opt-in and opt-out, um, specifically who's excluded and what that means or what are the, what's the basis for exclusion, if any. What are the covered benefits? Um, what are the, what's the network and who's in and who's out? I mean, there's a lot of changes now that we are anticipating because of that. At the same time, we realize or we recognize that it's not just about <laughs> pushing out information, but being able to facilitate that exchange through some type of choice counseling. Um, giving you a health plan comparison chart with, let's say, 11 health plans, 
across four different pages, I don't know, it's kind of hard to make an informed health decision around that. If I give you a 50-page application and ask you to navigate that, let's say inside, I won't call out certain states, but if that is indeed what we're working with, um, it's very daunting to go through that process. And so with all this said, this at the same time, we also have to recognize that there's new modes for communication. You know, people access and receive information a lot of different ways, not only through the internet, through social media, through our families, through our coworkers. Um, we almost demand it at our fingertips in many instances. And so even with that said, you have to recognize that it's not necessarily a technology problem, but it's how we manage the information and how we have consistency in that information. And so when I talk about new modes, um, it's not necessarily to, to, to present social media, digital, so uh, mobile applications as kind of the silver bullet, but it's about the appropriate use of those technologies and still understanding that, you know, that cry for, fa on, for help on Facebook if someone's dealing with mental health and uh, co-occurring substance abuse disorder may not necessarily be the best platform uh, to manage that conversation. And so there is a certain amount of responsibility even in the channels that we use and understanding that there is no one size fits all. So let's bring it to the focus of today a little bit more in terms of what this particular forum is about and um, specifically this session is about the importance of cultural and linguistic competency, particularly as it relates to the communication. When we talk about culture, I think that's one of the most um, elusive, complex um, facets of, of our society when we think about all the things that influence our culture, our perspectives, our history, our families, our religious beliefs, our cultural norms, our geographical preferences. It's all of those things converging in at the same time that all help define our culture. And again, um, when we talk about different racial and minority ethnic groups around the country, it's not necessarily one group. Um, Spanish in New York City, it's a little different than Spanish in LA County. And the Spanish that we use or some of the constructs that we use in, in, in uh, Houston, Texas looks very different than Chicago. Um, and so being able to tailor based on those nuances. The reason why I stress this is because all of these things influence how we not only access the information, how we process it, and how we take the appropriate action. And again, that's very different for different groups. So just a few stats, and I will apologize to any of my old professors that are around. I'm a little older, so I can say that now. But um, I didn't cite my sources on this one, so I am a little guilty. But a lot of this, well, actually, Pew, Pew uh, research was at the bottom, so I did get it. I did get it. Um, but I thought this was pretty interesting. You know, when we look at just Hispanics, largest growing uh, minority group in the country, poised to be 30% of the population in years to come. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that there is a disparity between Hispanics and other racial and ethnic minority groups as it relates to the majority in terms of how we access health care insurance. And even within the Hispanic community, there are disparities between those that are born in the United States and those that are, um, have in, immigrated to the United States. And so just looking at the numbers, um, whether we go to CDC, Census, Pew, there's a num Enroll America, there's a number of different sources, but I think you'll see that there is a common message there in terms of just uh, the disparity in access to coverage. And so how do we not only identify the individuals who are not in care or who have coverage and are not in care, but how do we tailor our approaches to make sure that we reach them? The most difficult of the to be reached population, that's what, we fo that's what my focus is this year as we approach OE3. Um, it's not the low-hanging fruit like it was in open enrollment one and two. It's the most difficult. It's the people who maybe dug their heels in a little bit more, maybe gave up because they didn't get their, their answers, I mean, their, their, their call answered on the, on the first try didn't necessarily get the information that they were looking for, or maybe they were inundated with so much that they just, it was just too much, too much, too much. Um, that's a lot of what we deal with every day. So about 15 years ago, Maximus decided, as a part of our commitment to really understanding the communities that we serve, and that really goes back to the mission of the organization, helping government serve the people. Um, it is something that we practice, so this is not necessarily the company should feel, but it is a perspective that, you know, from the highest levels of our leadership down to that customer service rep in our call center or customer contact center, understanding that the challenge before us, the responsibility for us is really reaching the, end of the, the, the communities that we serve. When we talk about just how we communicate, um, it required looking at how can we communicate very complex information in a way that will be understood, that people can take the appropriate action and that they can process all of this information for not only themselves but their families. So that was 
part of the underpinning behind the center itself. I mean, like many organizations, particularly in the, in the communication space, multidisciplinary team, we've got researchers, we've got designers, we've got folks that only speak, speak in terms of click-through rates and media impressions. We've got people that only speak in InDesign and Apple products because they're designers. Um, we also have public health professionals like myself that understand the data-driven approaches. And sometimes it's not only the formative research on the front end, but it's the evaluation on the back end that all make this thing come together. Um, but it is a health communications team that's largely focused on improving the communications, not only within the Maximus projects, and even when I say Maximus, you have to keep in mind, again, it's the majority of the Medicaid managed care market. So our responsibility in this space is really to try to connect with each and every individual that's applying. Um, we do it through writing and editing, largely through print materials, um, because in many of our state programs, we're talking 70,000 mail runs quarterly. Um, we're talking about pushing out a full suite of content through our digital and social media and making sure that those are integrated. And at the same time, uh, preparing a well-trained, well-qualified, and well-positioned workforce that understand not only what questions to ask, but what's not being said on those calls so that we sit down and talk about how we can improve through our customer contact centers. So just briefly, when we look at the Mid-Atlantic region, just in terms of the, the center itself, last year we touched about 5.4 million. Uh, I wish I had all the insights and all the, but I don't, I don't. It's each year kind of allowing yourself to go through this process and not relying not only on what you've done last year, but also our partnerships to help guide us. And a lot of our work, particularly on the Medicaid side, we're working not only with uh, the state Medicaid programs, but we're working with a number of uh, community-based organizations. We're working with national organizations to really try to help improve the, the screening and the intake process as it relates to Medicaid, and then facilitating everything from the processing of applications down to the appeals on the back end and understanding what were some of the base, you know, what, what were some of the issues related to the appeals. I think one of the things we talked about internally last year was just when it came to someone providing documentation um, related to her employment, she submitted a res recipe and she talked about um, this was the basis for her she should, to show that she had gainful employment. She was a cook and she gave the recipe and so that was it kind of stuck out in my mind that, you know, when it comes to uh, appropriate documentation and how people understand, you know, not only what they do, but, you know, how to deliver the right information to, to answer the questions that are being asked, it's not necessarily intuitive. So there's so many different perspectives in this. And so, you know, when we think about just the communication itself across the states from Pennsylvania all the way to West Virginia, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, um, at least in the mid-Atlantic, that's, again, 5.4 million that we're, we're, that we're touching each and every day. And so that is a tremendous amount of communication. I'd say in, in the average, in the context of our enrollment broker projects on the Medicaid side, you, you, could, you potentially could receive any one of 165 documents that could come your way. Now that could range from a welcome letter to a health plan comparison chart, to an application, to an appeal notice, to a number of other documents in between. Um, but that's a lot of communication that's going out. It has to be written at the appropriate level uh, and it's not just about sixth or eighth grade reading levels, but it is about making sure that we're taking very complex information and presenting it in plain language. Let's just say it straight. You know, let's, let's take out some of the jargon, the legalese, and speak in a way that people understand, and that's actionable. It's, it's much easier said than done, um, but that is part of what we focus on. At the same time, um, the pursuit, and I use the word pursuit more so than anything else when it comes to cultural competency, because I think it starts with the individual. Um, and trying to understand the communities that we're setting foot in and trying to not only um, cast aside our thoughts, our impressions, maybe our biases, our, you know, you don't know until you kind of humble yourself and you step into the forum and just say, I don't know, and I'm here to learn. And sometimes it's the message, it's not only the message, but it's the messenger um, in some of these conversations is equally important. So when we talk about cultural competency, I wish there was a suite of checklists and frameworks, and we are very familiar with those, but I think our ability to focus on cultural competence comes through not only through our communications, but through our customer contact centers, through how we focus on digital and social media engagement and the integration between all of these things. Um, I'll get into each one a little bit more, but I think you know, when it comes to cultural competency, I think even within our organization, you know, we have heated battles, not battles, maybe challenges, discussions, um, where we challenge one another to make sure that we pressure test these things that we're not necessarily being the one to introduce literacy challenges into these programs. And I, I will say that again, that we're not introducing 
health literacy challenges into these programs because if I look at a document and let's say we translated, but we did not adapt that translation to a local, you know, to a particular state. If I go and do that for this one document and don't take into consideration those under other 150 documents that could be delivered, then I could be essentially introducing challenges into this program if I'm not coordinating just within the state, but also providing some level of, of, of technical assistance very loosely structured, but to the plans or to the other stakeholders to make sure that we are all co communicating in one voice around these topics. And it's not easy. It's, I would be lying if I said it was, but it is part of our focus. It's really what we're focused on is trying to help improve the state of the communications within not only our health insurance programs, but also looking at the, the connection between those that are accessing health insurance to those that are accessing social programs, whether it be WIC, TANF, Welfare to Work, um, some of our federal subsidies on, on the federal side, whether it's Ticket to Work, um, our returning veterans, looking at the communication not only from a program perspective, but also from a community perspective, and that we're consistent in how we're shaping our messages, the use of our terminology, and how we're adapting those to those nuances to that community. Um, and I'll, I'm probably going a little bit before uh, Juan Carlos, but what I really want to talk about was just the work that we do as it relates to class, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, but what I will say is that just focusing on the, the importance of communication and language assistance as a part of the class framework is very important. Um, it is one of the, the deliberate strategies that we've adopted as a nation to really help address um, eliminating health disparities. And so just briefly, as we look at some of the, the work that we've done, and I'm just showing just a couple of examples, but you know, even in this, you're seeing from New York to California to Texas to Massachusetts, um, it's not only in the Spanish translation, but it's also in the adaptation of those words. It's about bringing that things down to an appropriate reading level. The design matters. The imagery matters. Um, the accessibility of these materials in terms of if I am a sighted individual and I can read through and fill out the application on my own, should someone who is visually impaired and or blind have a different experience? That, that's an important question because many folks, particularly when we look at our communities within some of these programs, are dealing with some of these health challenges. And so making sure, again, that the materials, even in the print world, um, are understood by all, that we bring it down to that lowest common denominator, that we speak to every person in the room to the best of our ability. Um, that is a part of our commitment. Our customer contact centers um, starts with the people in the room. You know, we hire from within the community. So the DC call centers at LaFont Plaza, Maryland is uh, downtown Baltimore. I'm not exactly sure where Virginia is. I haven't had a chance to make it out there, but I do try to visit all the customer contact centers around the country to get a better sense of of what's going on. And I sit down and I talk to the CSRs, uh, the customer center, uh, center representatives, to really understand what are you hearing on the phones? What's, what are the challenges? What's the anxiety from? Um, how can we do this better? And that's an ongoing commitment. But it starts with the people on the other end of that line, uh, the people from that community, people that are vested in that community. Um, so we, in many of our programs, we hire from within the state or within that particular geographical area, because that's a way of not only ensuring buy-in um, for, for, for the program, but also for the individuals around the table so that we understand what's going on in our communities. Um, we have telephony and uh, scripts and things like that that also guide us. There's also data-driven approaches and analytics on the back end that help give us a better sense of the overall experience. But a lot of it starts with the people. And so there's training on some of the most basic aspects of HIPAA and privacy and security. and what do you do if someone sends you not only their birth certificate, but their social security card and a whole bunch of other modes of uh, identifiable information? Um, how can you um, manage that conversation in a way that we're maintaining the privacy and security provisions of all, of all the individuals involved? And so that is a part of what we do in our, our contact centers, and it's an ongoing uh, focus in terms of training and retraining um, to make sure that we're prepared to handle that search. Um, Again, with the digital and social, I mean, I think we've had a lot of good success. Um, it's not the tool of choice for every program, but in some, we've seen better results than other. In New York, in particular, we've seen, um, in many instances, you know, the use of Facebook being very, very important as a, as a platform to reinforce certain messages. But at the same time, Twitter is an important construct uh, when it comes to reinforcing other messages. And so what I would say here is that when it comes to digital and social engagement, Again, it really depends on the audience and who we're trying to reach, and so it's not for everyone. Um, my mother won't do it. 
um, she won't send information electronically. And so I would not encourage that if it relates to our duals or our seniors. Um, but it is an important approach when we think about how we approach <coughs> cultural and linguistic competency through the use of digital and social media, even now to mobile apps. Just a quick final few thoughts. Um, there is no one size fits all in all of this. And so it is an ongoing effort and quest to, to build on what we know from last year, the years prior, um, other industries, other groups, other organizations, even down to our CBOs, community-based organizations to really challenge ourselves to really make cultural and linguistic competency at forefront of what we do. Um, providing equal service and attention to all so that there is no two-tiered experiences for anyone. Meeting people where they are, whether it be through the use of faith-based organizations, uh, our call center activities, folks in the field, on the ground, um, but taking it to them. I mean, it's even though we're a global company publicly traded, we still have that grassroots feel in terms of the work that we do. And last, consumer testing. I think that's, that's key. And all that we do, I mean, last year we tested about 1,200 notices. We tested websites and mobile apps, not mobile apps, but social media and other communication products with over 800 folks. And so just testing, understanding that we know the voice of the consumer, that we know their attitudes, perceptions, beliefs, that we understand that they, whether they can or cannot make a decision around um, insurance coverage and what's needed. The only way to really get to that is through testing. So I've said a lot, and I know I've gone fast, but I hope there was some of that that you all were able to absorb. I am sorry for going over a little bit, but thank you. All right. Wonderful, and next we'll have Mr. Arroyo. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Juan Carlos Arroyo. I'm a research analyst at SRA International within the Health Determinants and Disparities Practice. Um, I work with a contract or with OMH on a contract that manages uh, Think Cultural Health Initiative and the National Class Standards, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so yeah, let's just get it started. So just a little bit about the company itself. On the left hand side, you'll see we're, we're founded in 1978 and we're a little over 5,000 people. Um, but the team that I work with, the Health Determinants and Disparities Practice, a team of six. So we all wear many hats and are involved uh, very intricately in all the uh, aspects of developing uh, policies that are related to the national class standards, cultural and linguistic competence, and how those can be adapted to different, different communities and other diverse populations across the United States. <coughs> Oh, and it bears mentioning that, again, uh, you know, what we specialize in is CLC, um, National Class Standards and E-Learning Approaches, which I'll talk about a little briefly later on in the presentation. So this is just general overview. Uh, I'll give you an introduction uh, on the Office of Minority Health. Uh, we'll also uh, take a more academic approach that, that, than Quinta's presentation because that's the nature of mine. Um, so we'll describe what CLC is briefly. Um, also do the same with uh, class, which is culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Um, then how those are and how those intersect and how the national class centers were born out of those two constructs. And then think cultural health, which is a one stop shop where you can find um, e learning resources and just general information on both of these things, including training. So here you go. HHS Office of Minority Health, its mission um, is to improve the health of minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that help eliminate health disparities. Sounds uh, straight, straight enough and simple enough, right? <laughs> um, so as I briefly mentioned uh, earlier, these are the, you know, OMH has a host of initiatives. The ones that we're involved in and that I'm here to speak to you today are the National Class Standards uh, for Culturally and Linguistic Appropriate Services, in healthcare, that's the official title, by the way, um, and the Think Cultural Health Initiative. More on that later. So, so what is cultural and linguistic competence? Within his presentation, alluded to earlier. So, we probably should have started with mine and <laughs> gone, gone to his, but we're we're gonna we're gonna make it work. Um, so, CLC is a set of congruent behaviors, attitudes, and policies that come together in a system, agency, or among professionals that enable that system, agency, or professionals to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. As you all know, whether you're providers or in policy 
or community health workers, for example, um, all encounters that you have with your customers or your patients are cross-cultural. It doesn't matter whether you guys are from the same country. You now I'm Puerto Rican, um, but I've been removed from Puerto Rico for about 15 years. So the lingo and what what's, uh, I'm sure it's exactly, I'm sure it's very different what it was then from what it is now. So even when dealing with um, the same population, uh, CLC is, is very important, essential really. Okay, so now that we've talked about CLC, let's introduce class. So class are services that are respectful of and responsive to individual cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy levels, and communication needs, and that are employed by all members of an organization, regardless of its size, at every point of contact. Again, this relates to what I was just talking about, where it doesn't matter the nature of the interaction. It's it, 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 in some way, shape, or form, it's going to require um, some sort of competence on the CLC end. And certainly, if you're in the health and healthcare context, um, class is the way to go. So based on the nature of this breakout session, I just figured I, I could put a bunch of stats on here and talk about that all day. Um, but the two that jumped at me as I was doing a little bit of research on what disparities I wanted to talk about and how to frame it towards the CLC class context were these two. Um, I was actually unaware of the first one. Um, apparently 10% of Hispanic Latinos of all ages report their unfair or poor health outcomes. Um, I knew it was high, I didn't know it was that high. Um, just as alarming, nearly one in five Spanish-speaking U.S. residents delayed or refused uh, medical care because of language barriers. Again, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter what your age is, what, your gener what generation you're in, whether you just recently immigrated or whether you, you're, you're a third generation ex, uh, CLC in class and health and healthcare matters. Um, you know, we're a relatively, as Latinos, I say we, are a relative established population in the United States, and yet these disparities still persist. So here, so somewhat of a text-heavy slide, but just bear with me. Um, now that we've talked about CLC and class and just some general national statistics um, about why we think uh, it's important in health and healthcare, I'm just gonna give you guys a few examples of um, other dimensions where CLC and class are essential. Changing demographics, I've alluded to this earlier, but by 2060, uh, most of the, po uh, the population is projected to be 31% Hispanic, and I listed the rest of, uh, of the percentages there. What's more is that most of um, babies born in the US in two th by 2011, or in 2011, were um, a racial and ethnic minority already. Um, so the population's booming, as you guys already know, and with the disparities in, um, in, Latin in healthcare towards Latinos, um, again, the, in the, on the cost side, this is not to, for just the Latino population, but just in general. Um, the cost of health inequalities and premature deaths in the United States was calculated to be $1.24 trillion. Um, and eliminating these disparities would have saved around $229 billion. Uh, that's an inordinate amount of money. Um, obviously, CLC and class isn't the only answer. Um, there are other disparities um, that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily directly linked uh, to the provision of culturally and linguistic appropriate services, but certainly um, the correct provision of that would ameliorate these numbers. Um, you guys will know uh, probably about the Affordable Care Act, and um, King Te alluded to that early in his presentation, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. I'll touch upon that a little bit later as they relate to the national class standards, uh, specifically theme two, but we've already seen that um, several states, including California, Connecticut, New Jersey, Oregon and Washington have implemented cultural and linguistic competency, um, uh, cultural and linguistic competency really um, in, their, in their policies. Um, and then there's some information there on accreditation 
bears noting, and I'm going to read straight out of my notes because I do not know the name of the publication, but the Joint Commission developed uh, advancing effective communication, cultural competence, and patient family-centered care, a roadmap for hospitals. So similar to the National Class Standards document that I'll be talking about later, um, accreditation bodies have, uh, have wisened up um, to how important this is and have themselves um, written policy documents in uh, describing how to implement and adopt these. So next slide, um, just a few more examples. Um, you know, these may seem obvious, but maybe not. And even if, even if not, they bear, they bear mentioning. Um, limited English proficient patients who are not able to communicate effectively with their providers are at greater risk for medical errors. This is where, where CLC and class directly come into play. Um, again, readmissions and length of stay um, certainly within the context of limited English proficiency patients, those are inextricably linked. Um, and the resources that I'll be talking about later and the national class standards in particular are a way, uh, a vehicle to train providers um, to, better, to better their services. And related to that quality of care, uh, the, the education of CLC um, at the provider level, and again, when I use provider, I don't mean just medical providers. Um, this, and we'll touch upon it a little bit when we discuss the national class standards, but this has to run, to, in order for it to be effective, it has to run the gamut. It, it can't just be at the pa a patient to provider level. Um, leadership needs to be involved, uh, board members or board of trustees need to buy in um, and actually um, become champions of these policies. Um, facilities at a hospital. I mean, I used to work at a hospital as a clinical research coordinator, and I remember as I was guiding patients through, through you know, through the lab to the x-ray, like, I, I would run into situations where, uh, you know, uh, an Ethiopian patient or a lady from El Salvador would ask something to the facilities manager, and they wouldn't really know how to handle it. Um, they'd direct them the wrong place, or they'd act standoffish, or they try but give them completely different directions. And at least when it was uh, in Spanish, I could kind of jump in and try. Um, I admittedly probably failed a couple of times, but um, it has to be at all levels. And certainly uh, with patient adherence, and I, I, won't, I won't read it, but the gist of it is if, the patient, if there's clarity of communication between the patient and the provider, um, adherence is going to go up. Um, and if adherence is better um, to treatment plans, then preventive the use of preventive ser services goes down, costs go down. So these are all linked. Um, these, uh, especially the first two, discrimination and overcoming barriers, the, there's uh, a wealth of literature on these. Um, I just want I just wanted to bring them up because it's as established a population as Latinos are in the United States, in my opinion, um, there's still a, a good deal of discrimination um, and barriers that need to be overcome um, related to that. Okay, so we talked about cultural and linguistic competency very briefly, um, described class, cultural and linguistic appropriate services and the provision of it and how important it is. Um, now we're going to talk about the National Class Standards, which is a guiding document um, to do just that. So the Office of Minority Health developed this framework, the National Class Standards, to operationalize cultural and linguistic competency or class. And I use those interchangeably. Um, so CLC, you know, we, we can define it, but in providing class, you are achieving CLC. So it's just a matter it's semantics, really. So I might use those interchangeably. Don't please don't be confused. Um, so we are heavily involved with uh, the national class standards as a, as a practice at SRA. Um, I wasn't there at the time, but um, during the enhancement initiative, which started in 2010 and lasted three years, um, we managed that process alongside OMH to release the enhanced initiatives which, um, and, and they were enhanced really to 
um, take into account the change of demographics, the, the rapid, rapidly growing Latino population, and other services that were now available that weren't then in 2010. And prior to that, like between 2000 and 2010, when um, the original class standards were launched. So now that I've talked about all that, and I know I'm going really fast, but by a show of hands, who's actually heard of the national class standards? Oh, OK. Wow. Good. So I hope this is not super repetitive. Um, for those of you that have not, um, just keep going. Um, but yeah, that's actually more than I thought I was going to see. So that's, that's, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Cautiously optimistic. So what is the purpose? Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, advanced health equity, improve quality of services, help eliminate disparities. It's no mistake that these are also um, the, the objectives of the Office of Minority Health, and this is their, their cornerstone initiative, in, in my opinion. So there's 15 of them. I won't cover all of them. I'm just going to tease the themes so that you guys go actually go to the Think Cultural Health website and check them out for yourself. Uh, please register. It's great. There's a lot of resources. But um, what we're going to do is just talk about the first standard and then the themes and how they relate to the provision of culturally and linguistic appropriate services. And then from there, we'll talk about the Think Cultural Health website and the resources that are available for you all there. So the first standard. Um, I had a handout that I, I'll, I'll give it to you guys at the end. Um, I basically printed out a handout, which is a fact sheet of the National Class Standards. It briefly describes, um, it gives you a rationale for them and also lists them there. Um, but anyways, we're, we're going to go over the theme, so it doesn't really matter. The first standard um, reads, provide equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. So that's everything, basically, right? At least as we conceive it. Um, so the first standard, is, the, the way we design them is if you achieve 2 through 15, you, if you practice 2 through 15, you achieve the first one. So the first standard is the cornerstone, the principal standard, as we call it. So theme one. Uh, or governance, leadership, and workforce emphasizes what I was talking about earlier, where um, the provision of culturally and linguistic appropriate services needs to be at all levels. Um, and it requires investment and support. I mean, so, some of these, you know, a lot of organizations are, um, and Quinta alluded to earlier, um, practice, actively practice theme two standards, which I'll get to in a second, um, because they're mandated federally. Um, but what our contention is that if you try to adopt and, and actively implement all of them, um, not only will the popu not only will health outcomes improve, but eventually, after you make that first investment, costs will go down. So, as I said, communication and language assistance is our second theme. Um, that's pretty. Uh, straightforward. Um, I just want to make sure that we understand that by communication and language assistance, we're also including sign language, braille, and of course, oral interpretation and the translation of materials and health, ed health education and patient intake forms, etc. And then the last theme covers standards 9 to 15, and um, we titled that Engagement, Continuous Improvement, and Accountability. Um, this, this set of standards is what is really getting at um, assessing how they're adopted, how they're being implemented, um, and how they're being maintained. Um, it's not only uh, important to adopt them and accept that they're integral to the provision of quality care, but in order to better um, the, the services, you need to assess them, you need to evaluate them. And ourselves, we're, we're actually, I won't get into it a whole lot, but we're, we're working on that right now to see how institutions are doing just that. So those are the three themes of the standards. Here's the blueprint. This is the implementation guide. Um, it was published by the Office of Minority Health in 2013, as you see there. Um, it has a chapter per standard. Um, and I like it. You're taking a picture. That's good. I like it. Um, 
So basically, um, it, it's, it's a collection of resources. Um, what I would like for you guys to take home today is that there's actual instructions on how to implement the standards there. Each standard has a chapter. Um, you can, uh, you know, depending on the context of your organization, it may not directly apply, but certainly it'll give you an idea of how to go about, you know, um, making a, a health needs assessment, um, what resources you can tap into online or in print about how to, how to do that, um, and just more general information on the, the importance of the national class standards. Okay, so we talked about CLC, we talked about class, we talked about the national class standards, and now we're gonna talk about Think Culture Health where you can find information on those three things. So this is a screenshot of the homepage um, as you see, tabs run across. You can access the class and class standards tab where you'll find information on what I was just talking about, or you can go over um, to the continuing education where you'll find the e learning program suite that we offer, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, think Cultural Health, or at least we'd like to think of it as a one stop shop for um, health professionals to turn to information about class and health equity and advancing it at every point of contact. So here is a list of the e-learning programs that we offer um, for physicians. Uh, well, I'd like to say before I get into the specifics of the e-learning programs is that we've recently uh, reached a, a huge milestone. We've awarded over 1 million continuing education credits when you take all of these combined. So it's widely used. Uh, thankfully, people are seeing the use of them, um, and they're actually uh, getting, getting something out of it. Um, for the physicians, I'd just like to say for the providers that are here, um, clinical in nature, um, it's, it's uh, accredited for you. Um, nurse practitioners and PAs, or physician's assistants. Um, the nursing e-learning program, the second box you see there, is accredited for nurses and social workers. Thirdly is the disaster preparedness and crisis response curriculum. That's accredited for responders, or first responders, psychologists, social workers, and dentists. <coughs> And then the oral health program, which is accredited for dentists, uh, dental assistants, and dental hygienists. Um, and what we do with these programs aside, the, the purpose of them is to train providers on how to infuse CLC into their daily practice. Um, so there's case study vignettes, pre-test and post-test uh, course <laughs> evaluations, et cetera, so that as the provider is taking the e-learning program, they get a uh, not only the content and the information, but it just for how they're doing and how they can better their practices through the CLC class lens. Um, the last there is not accredited, but it was newly launched, um, launched uh, June 23rd of this year. That's the Promoting Healthy Choices and uh, Community Changes Program. And here's the screenshot. I don't know if you can see the units, but it, it's composed of four units. Um, the first two um, are about um, basically facilitating promotores de salud's practice uh, to change, uh, make healthy lifestyle choice changes within individuals. And then the second two, un or the unit C and D rather, um, are about how to make community changes and how to facilitate those. Um, this program marks the first um, federal government curriculum that advances professional development within promotores. Um, I like mentioning it not only because I'm integrally uh, involved in the project itself, but also because um, promotores de salud or community health workers um, are increasingly are receiving increased recognition as a vehicle to um, be culturally competent messengers within their own communities. Um, this can affect um, positively, the, you know, the access to care, utilization, um, health education intake or knowledge gains. Um, it can even get people connected um, to health insurance, as, as Quinta was talking about earlier. Now, I'm not saying that our e-learning program does all of that, but it's a step. Um, and OMH's acknowledgement of such is, is, is huge. Um, lastly, I uh, want to mention the communication guide, which is a specific resource um, uh, that you can find through Think Cultural Health. Um, it's the Guide to Providing Effective Communication and Language Assistance Services. Um, it's a tool to help organizations communicate or better communicate with individuals receiving care and services. It has two tracks. Um, the first is for administrators. 
um, who, with information on planning and implementation um, and how to provide effective communication and language assistance services within their own context. And then the second track is tailored towards healthcare providers or those providing direct care services. So it's not necessarily geared towards just clinical providers. Uh, so coming to the end of the presentation, um, I just want to say that, um, and I hope that through this breakout session you've received as much as that, you know, class is hugely important. It's a passion of ours. Um, you guys are at least interested because you're here. Um, I'm assuming it's a passion of yours as well. If not, I hope this got you closer to that point. Um, it, we, we need to do better about engaging with our, our consumers or our patients um, in a way that's respectful, um, that's mindful of uh, cultural differences, and that through that actually gets us to improve outcomes. So before I close and we start open for questions, I suppose I just want to acknowledge the people that worked uh, on this project. And there's my information. And then you can access Think Cultural Health at www.thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov. Um, you can send me emails there, or you can send them also to advancing class at thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I would like to uh, thank our, our two presenters, Mr. Ibit and Mr. Arroyo. This was uh, quite informative, uh, and I think that you know, for most of us, I know that I was very interested in, in this particular topic because we do talk so much about cultural competency, linguistic competency at all levels, and this is really, really uh, critical. And so we do have time for some Q&A. Um, I just wanted to throw one question just for clarification as I was listening to both uh, presenters. Um, the, the nuance around language I thought was very interesting when it relates to Spanish because, you know, I heard, um, Mr. but you talk about the differences obviously um, depending on where you are and where you're from. Uh, and then Mr. Arroyo also spoke about the fact that it's so difficult to keep up with all those nuances because things do shift very rapidly. And I know, you know, I was born and raised in Venezuela and there was a distinction, right? You know, in school we were taught Castellano, which was the proper mm -hmm. Spanish and how that's how you uh, present yourself when you're in a professional uh, realm or anything that has to do with published materials. And then you have colloquial, Mm -hmm. uh, Venezuelan, which everybody, so how do you negotiate that? Because I think that sometimes it's very risky to try to keep up with all the colloquial uh, nature, and, and I tend to opt for the more Castellano sort of formal way, um, but of course, you know, in a level that everybody can, can sort of digest. So is there, are there any best practices around that particular nuance in terms of Spanish uh, and the language and, and the style? I would say, just from my experience, there's two things that we typically do. One is uh, consumer testing to find out, to that very point, what terms resonate best and which ones, particularly if we're dealing with you know, communities where there's larger Hispanic influences from different you know, countries, whether it's Puerto Rico, Mexico, um, to find out what works in that community. So that's the first thing. The second is kind of relying on the CBOs and the advocates in those communities for buy-in. Um, largely, they keep us honest. They make us, we, we use the terminology that works within that community. I could probably argue the merits of either approach, um, but reaching, being able to reach someone, that's, that's the ultimate goal. And so in some instances, we are a little more structured, a little more formal, but then in others, when it, particularly when it comes to messaging, um, you will find that there's a little bit more flexibility in some of the programs. One of the things that we also have as an underpinning is a very defined glossaries that kind of help standardize the use of term, terminology across certain programs. And so. If there is a change that we've decided to implement, let's say in, in the Medicaid program, specifically around a welcome letter or packet, that that same terminology is being carried forward in all the other subsequent communications. So there is a management element to it, but there's also asking people what works best in your community component to it just as much. Is there really anything on that? Yeah, and I mean, uh, I'd just like to add really that um, as far as uh, the patient to provider interactions, or as a health and healthcare system, uh, the usage, and you alluded to it, the, the usage of uh, community stakeholders and the development of materials um, is integral to, um, you're not gonna get it every time, but close as close to 100% as you can um, is, is very important. And then um, Quinta alluded to in the presentation too when he was discussing uh, the health literacy aspects, um, plain language 
Um, so colloquialisms or false fluencies between patient and provider um, happen. But uh, if, if you're speaking and disseminating materials in plain language, it certainly limits the extent mm -hmm. to which that happens. So, Great. OK, any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, Ms. Rivera. Uh, I'm Yvonne Rivera. I'm a public health professional. I'm happy to be here at my alma mater. Oh. And uh, I speak Spanish and Puerto Rican. Yeah. <laughs> and so I have a question for Mr. Arroyo. OK. Senor Arroyo. Um, uh, you mentioned that training for uh, healthcare providers. I wonder if you have a component to train them on how to work with interpreters. So I the believe. question, let me just repeat, the question is uh, if you have training of uh, for medical uh, providers, healthcare providers, on how to work, work with, with interpreters, interpreters, interpreters for mean, the record. Um, hopefully, uh, the patient is lucky enough to have an interpreter. Exactly. And right. is there a component to train physicians or healthcare providers to work with an interpreter, which is a very important component on how to use or yeah. work with. Yes. So two-pronged uh, answer to that, and pleasure, you all. Um, so through the physician's e-learning program, there's case study vignettes that allude to as much, but more importantly, as I was talking about towards the end of the presentation, the language, the language and communications guide has two tracks, and one of them is specifically for providers, um, and not just clinical, but just providers in general, providers of services, um, and your question would be answered there. So, so there is, there is a guide, an implementation guide um, that attacks that issue. On how to work with interpreters. Correct. Because in many instances, that's a barrier. That can become a barrier. Oh, yeah. Um, I, thank you so much. I have a question for Mr. Thank you for sharing a wealth of information today. It's really wonderful, wonderful to hear that everything that we expect uh, to move forward and work with our communities mm -hmm. of uh, minority health are taking place. Mr. Ivor, I have a question. Uh, in terms of um, concept testing the materials, one of your last slide, you made an emphasis with concept testing material, with concept testing. What methodology and how do we go about doing concept testing or material testing? Um. It, there's not necessarily one single approach. I would say sometimes, you know, we're uh, developing a sample within certain health plans, or we may be across the state. There's certain recruitment criteria that we may use, let's say income level, education attainment level, um, residency status, that may be part of. So within each of the different testing opportunities, there is a need to kind of define the recruiting criteria. In some instances, we use professional testing facilities, depending on the timing. If we have more time, I'd prefer going to a community-based organization because I, I just found it to be a much better experience overall and a, just a better recruiting process in general. Um, but in instances where we can, we do that. But if we don't have, if we don't, we actually end up using professional testing facilities. Um, and so we go through the recruitment process. We develop protocols, screeners, inclusion, exclusion criteria. Um, we go. We have trained researchers, many of which are bilingual. Um, and if not, they're not. If they don't speak the, the the actual language for the participant, we also bring in interpreters. Um, and our researchers actually work with interpreters as well to kind of conduct uh, the one-on-one -on -one cognitive testing. Um, probably for the work that we do, particularly from a literacy perspective, a lot of what we do probably moves more into the one-on-one -on -one testing and less from a, a focus group or survey type approach. It's really a one-on-one -on -one to try to understand where the bottlenecks, where the problems, where the issues are occurring, so that we can continue to refine the materials. Uh, the analysis, I mean, we could talk about different techniques and things like that, but it's really trying to understand from a communication perspective how to, how to feed that back into the perspective planning process and how we're iteratively improving those materials over time. So um, the methodology, I would say, is definitely a data-driven approach. In, in many instances, it starts with a lit review and probably culminates with, you know, subsequent revisions in many of the materials. Um, but really, the, you know, when you think about just the testing overall, it's the hardest part is really identifying what the, ha the path is and what the experience. We use terms like happy path, and there really is no happy path navigating an exchange. Um, and so trying to think of all the different scenarios, 
all the different types of applicants, and then having an appropriate cross-section of, of individuals to choose from, or at least to work with, should I say. Sorry. I think we have time for one more question, mm -hmm. so we can finish on time. The gentleman in the back. Hi, um, Ken Sharma. This question is for the gentleman from uh, OMA CMS. I understand health insurance literacy is a big problem, as um, Mr. Bishop said. How much effort is being put by HHS to actually have the health insurance organization change their terminology to be more user friendly as opposed to trying to educate the consumer come up with that that's a great question, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't I, problem I, as I, 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 <laughs> Yeah. It, I'll, I'll try to. <laughs> um, I'll help you out here. It's a, it's a state by state. I mean, you know, and as our role, you know, we're, we don't necessarily have any affiliation with the plans themselves, so I can't tell BCBS yeah. what they can or cannot do. But to the extent that we are able to share our dictionaries, our approaches, our materials to help encourage them to be more consistent in their messaging, um, we definitely try to do that. We don't have the ability to tell the plans or the providers, you know, how best they should communicate. That is part of their prerogative. But if we all step back and realize that we're all committed, hopefully, to the same objectives, um, higher quality, better cost of services, better health outcomes, and part of being able to deliver more culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate services is, is a huge step in that direction. So to reiterate, I can't make it happen, but you do the best you can within the kind of the parameters that you're given. And, and it is state, in some states, it does look a little different. Um, in some states, there's probably a little bit more deliberate in pushing the plans to a specific particular standard. In others, the, the plans are, and I don't want to make it so much kind of a divide, but there's influences involved. And in, you know, it's all of us coming together to kind of communicate around this one topic, understanding that everybody's kind of got a slightly different perspective, different set of priorities, and definitely a different set of approaches. But um, if we can agree that the, the use of terminology, the, the timing of those messages, and the communications is important. And we all try to work from that standpoint um, to the best of our ability. It would be great if institutions began to adapt to the changes versus having to work towards well, yeah. the change adapting yeah. to the institutions. The exactly. I mean, that would be a great mm -hmm. outcome. I think last word, somebody was just... Yeah, I just wanted to add, that's our family choice. And we, I mean, we don't take this very lightly. We, we actually, um, our parents are bilingual staff. We um, utilize different um, software to make sure that like readable uh, and appropriate level. Um, and, and I think we brought up a good point. It's not so much um, the translation that is in the language that, that the, the member or the customer can understand, but also you, you encounter um, people that cannot. So you need someone there to actually put a, relay the message, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and, and from a health insurance, many cases, you, you need help. There's a lot of information. That's very cool. Absolutely. Um, so with that, I think we're going to close. I think that was a very good point um, because it's not one-sided. It's not one-dimensional. Um, and I think we've heard a lot of really wonderful uh, work and information that we can all use um, as we try to address this extraordinary shift that has already occurred in our country but continues to, to happen um, as things become more and more complicated. Um, I just want to just announce, of course, that the next round of breakout sessions starts at 2.45, so I think there's a little bit of time. But another round of applause for Mr. Ibn and Mr. Arroyo for their work.